Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a true pleasure for me to be here um, and talk to you about um, the power of open access to space or um, an Austrian, a Belgium and an Irish walk into a bar. Um, it actually was this bar in Strasbourg um, sometime in, uh, in 2012 where we sat down and we did something like this and then about 18 months later we have done this. And so the story that I would like to share with you today is how we went from a napkin into space in just 18 months. Now what did we start with? We started with two things. The first things we started with is um, a slide that looks pretty funny right now. Um, as happens when you move from a PC to a real computer called an Apple. Um, we looked at, um, see, it doesn't even work at all, right? So what we're supposed to see here is a chart which shows a straight line, which is how we think intuitively, which is linear interpolation. Our brains are very, very good in estimating, you know, you do something 10 times, you know, how much do you get? But technologies are starting to improve more and more exponentially, and it's starting to affect more and more areas of our life. And unfortunately, our brain are completely incapable of predicting what happens when things move exponentially. That has you know, good outcomes when you think about computational speed. So the iPhone that we carry around today is actually faster than the Crate 2 supercomputer that I used when I was working at CERN as a physicist. It also has bad outcomes when you think of like 2008 and the financial crisis. But basically we looked at an exponentially improving technology in space and realized that there is exactly that business opportunity because people were linearly extrapolating where this technology is going when de facto, de facto it was improving exponentially. So for example, here what you see is like a sensor that you do in space for measuring where the sun is for where is the satellite oriented. And in six years, the size went down two orders of magnitude, the cost went down an order of magnitude. So you got three orders of magnitude price performance improvement. Or this is like um, a horribly looking slide, even worse so, but basically for 5,000 euros, you can buy a satellite kit off the internet today. And that is an actual satellite with a programming kit that you could use. So we have this exponentially improving technology. Now, having a cool technology is not enough, right? Whenever people start with technology looking for a problem, that normally spells, spells problem for the company. So the other thing we had is a huge and well-defined problem in the United States, but also in Europe. And that is the lack of so-called STEM workers, science, technology, engineering, and math graduates. The problem in the US is particularly precipitous, but even in Europe, if you talk to companies in, uh, in, in Germany, for example, they also say that we are not sure that our industry will have the necessary skilled workers in the areas which drive innovation. We also know how to solve that problem, because especially in the US, what is lacking is the inspiration and the qualification. So people start out being initially interested, but then during high school, they bore them to death, especially over there. And the outcome is that we do not get enough graduates. But if we give them hands-on projects, and the first robotics competition has done a phenomenal job there in bringing students hands-on projects, 500,000 in the last year. And looking at the statistics there, it showed that students who go through such a project are twice as likely to keep on going into the STEM fields. So we know the problem, we know the solution, and we actually have a technology. So here is our idea. Let's give a satellite to any high school students for 250 bucks. Well, that's exactly what we then did. The satellites are called Artisan 1 and Artisan X. They are about this size. Right? So this is an actual satellite frame. Um, for legal reasons, I couldn't bring an actual satellite. I would love to. Um, but this is the actual satellite. Um, the two that we launched are the world's 
first crowdsourced launched satellites in space. We had a very successful Kickstarter campaign where people from all across the world pledged money for us to launch those two satellites. We filled it with a host of sensors and Arduino processors. As we know, Arduino is from Italy and is a big um, development platform for people to build homebrew uh, home projects and, and, and hardware hacking. And then we combined it with an open development environment. Uh, we put in uh, an online platform for people to develop code so they don't have to download any software. We added an API and an SDK, as every good open source project should do. We added some hardware so that people have this hands-on engagement. Um, some of the sensors, there's like a company here, um, Spectrino, um, uh, a European company that we partnered with, who has like one of the smallest spectrometers, and it is in space right now. Another European company from Spain, the Valium, we have their Geiger counters in space. And we added video tutorials very similar to like an Udacity or Coursera. I was one of the participants, for example, in that Stanford AI class. And Evola, you have hands-on engaging space education. So students get to control our satellites. They get to write a code to, let's say, measure the Earth's magnetic field. And then you get this amazing, empowering experience, right? You get the students, they write their code, they measure the Earth's magnetic field. And then they say, Ms. Jones, my data looks different from the textbook image, you know, with this, this nice Earth, with nice little symmetrical lines. And then Ms. Jones says, Mary, you're correct. The textbook is wrong, but your data is right. And suddenly you have a vastly different educational experience. Not only did you get to touch space and run your own experiments, but you realized the power of doing something yourself, measuring it yourself, together with some classmates, and learning something that most likely you won't forget. But then we realized there is something much, much bigger happening here. We realized this power of open, uh, of open access to something that can unleash something even bigger. And it reminded us of a story that I'd like to tell you about um, a technology company, pretty successful company, and they, they developed a new user interface, but for a relatively boring existing device. And then normally in the, in, in the, in the past, those technology companies that say, OK, I have a new interface, and this is what the consumer is going to do to them. But then they had like a really crazy idea. They said, what if we don't tell the consumer how to use it? What if we crowdsource the use of that technology? What if we create an open access to it and let the crowd figure out what to do with it? So this is what they did. The device was a microprocessor. It had you know, four sensors attached to it. It had that simple user interface. And then they created an SDK and an API. And then, and by now you will know exactly what I'm talking about, they created an app store. And let the world innovate on top of that device. And the outcome is that today we have about a million applications developed for this device it has been downloaded 50 billion times, and revenue from that alone is projected to be something like $22 billion. Now, that completely and radically changed how the telephone market worked, because beforehand, cell phones were a boring device with a horrible interface, but even if it had a better interface, the company making the phone were telling consumers how to use it. And Apple completely flipped it on its head. And people came up with absolutely crazy ideas that no one could have prevented. Like the vibrometer from the phone being able to uh, detect what you type on the virtual keyboard, or the microphone being used for Americans to measure like, the, um, the, the strength of a, of a storm. No one could have predicted those applications. But the people came up with it, and all what it was, a microprocessor, and four sensors, and a simple user at, um, API. Open access to smartphone development. Moore's Law helps a little bit, because every year, every two years, we get a new device. And we realized, we looked at this and said, well, this looks darn familiar, actually. 
I mean, if you look at us, we have a microprocessor, we got 10 sensors, we have a simple user interface, SDK and API, we got Moore's Law, we got open access space exploration for 250 bucks. So that was already a pretty good start. You know, I'm pretty excited about that one. You know, we had um, people signing up all across the world, wanting to get access to our satellite. Um, and, and we realized that there is something even bigger going on in the background. Something that many of us actually have seen beforehand already. And that is much bigger than just, you know, doing something about the, the STEM education problem in Europe and in, and in Asia. Something that goes significantly further. And that is driven by the dramatic cost reduction. Once you move from non-standard devices that cost $500 million, which is you know, what most satellites cost, to something that is the size of a good bottle of Grüner Veltliner, or maybe a little bit more expensive than a good bottle of Grüner Veltliner, but massively cheaper. And the movie that we have seen happened in the 80s, when a computer was synonymous to a mainframe, meaning that it is very large, it is very expensive, it is completely non-standard. I mean, I, one of my first summer jobs was working on a Kinsley machine, and that was entirely different than an IBM machine, which was entirely different than the VAX. Things were not transferable between those machines. And then eventually, the word computer was synonymous to a personal computer, which was cheap, it was easily upgradable, it was a standard. So suddenly you had massive amounts of people innovating on it. And that, that sentence from, from people who said, no one will ever need a computer at home. There is a global world market of five computers. They were massively wrong, as we know today. And exactly the same thing is happening in space. As we replace those $500 million devices with an inexpensive and rapidly improving network of satellites. We're not talking about one or two satellites. We're talking hundreds or, as Pete Warden from NASA Ames, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, and is a, you know, uh, someone that I highly respect, and he knows us well, and is a big supporter of us, says 100,000. He's you know, one of the people who said, I want the satellite for every student. Now, what can you do if you have eyes over the planet everywhere all the time? What problems can you solve? Now, the first thing you've got to realize is that 72% of our planet is water. And the only way to have eyes over water is through satellites, if you want to have it all the time. So I'm going to run through some of the problems that you can solve with having this access um, from satellites. Although I'm not claiming that I have the answer to that, and I'm going to talk to that um, uh, in a second a little bit more. So what are the data that we are focusing on that we want to build applications for? First one is weather prediction, both from having better forecasts about weather, as well as having things that help you to prevent and plan for weather. There were $150 billion of insured and uninsured losses last year. Sandy alone, I used to live in New York for a long time, um, had kept many of my friends stranded without electricity, without water, and cost about $60 billion. If we had better prediction, it would have cost less because we would have prepared earlier. And if we had worse prediction, it would have cost twice as much and cost twice as many lives. And weather and the unpredictability of weather has, in general, a $250 billion impact on the US GDP alone, in areas from agriculture to insurance to power companies to the financial markets. So if you have 100 satellites that gather weather data, and 94% of all data that goes into the weather prediction is coming from satellites, but right now, there is globally something like six satellites. And because governments are running out of money, including the US government, that will go down over the next two, three years dramatically, as, for example, the US is losing coverage from their weather forecast satellites. Another area is, uh, is illegal fishing. The ocean and its vastness is simply too expensive for people to monitor with ships. 
But with satellites, we can actually have an impact on anywhere between 10 to 20 billion dollars of losses, 20 million tons of fish being illegally fished. Same thing with, um, uh, with piracy. Six billion dollar problem still today, because most of the time we do not know where ships are. Our constellation or another company's constellation will be able to track that. But that is not all. Think of, of Fukushima, and if they had a warning of the, of the tsunami coming, they could have turned down the power plants. And it was only 30 minutes, but because we would have eyes over the ocean at all times, that would have been plenty possible. Think of crop intelligence and precision farming, which has driven up um, yield per acreage in the US tremendously, but has countries like India and China lagging behind because they do not have access to satellite technology at an affordable uh, price point. Moving down satellite costs from 500 million to 500,000, we will be able to give them data that will massively improve the food supply. There is a host of areas that we can envision those satellites and such a satellite network providing data for the world, individuals, companies, and governments based on this power of open access to space exploration by a standard technology with rapidly decreased price point and an open uh, access software architecture. Now, one of the questions that, you know, especially critical people of those CubeSat technology often ask, yeah, but tell me, what is the killer app for CubeSats? And the truth is, I do not have an answer. But I do remember that in the 80s, the same question was asked for the PC. And the naysayers coming from the mainframe said, what's the killer app for PCs? And does anyone know what the answer was back then? It was kitchen recipes. That's why people said, you won't want to have a PC at home, it's kitchen recipes. And the truth is that clearly that wasn't the killer app. And the truth is that I'm pretty sure in five years, someone else will stand here and say, Peter had no clue what he was talking about. The killer app was, I have no idea what, because I probably didn't mention it today. But whenever you have access to a new medium, you get access to new data, like computational power, or you get access to space, it is obvious to me that that is going to dramatically change what we know about our planet, what we know about our life. Throwing the Internet of Things and the ability to link data up and down everywhere on the planet on an ongoing basis at vastly reduced cost, and you start to be able to see the power of what this can do. Now, Jürgen asked me one thing to, um, uh, to share about, now, you come from Austria, you went to school here, um, and then you went to the States and you started your company there. Is there anything that um, uh, you can bring from, from the US that you want to share here, here in Vienna? Um, and if there's one thing that you know, I find really inspirational over there, it is uh, it's a famous book from, uh, from uh, David Cohen called Do More Faster. And it's something that we really have ingrained in our company as a culture. And it's relatively simple. Do do more faster. I don't know if this is, gonna, this is not coming up. Um, there is a list of things, but it basically boils down, do a lot of things. Don't plan prototype. Ship is better than perfect. Iterate a lot. I think we in Europe, and you know, including myself, and maybe sometimes in Austria even, we are prone to hemming and hawing and planning and hatching and thinking rather than just doing things. When we sat in that cafe that I showed early on, we had no idea how to launch the satellite. But we just started, we get going. And then 18 months later, we had the world's first crowds on the satellites in space. This has never been done before. And we have a product which gives for 250 bucks every single student in the world a satellite in their hand. And with that, I want to leave you. There is a video that maybe you can show. Thank you, guys.
搭載した Ｈ２Ｂ ロケット４号機は平成２５年８月４日。